All right, we're going to turn to the the book of Jude this morning. A little book of Jude right before Revelation. We'll look at two verses. We are glad to have Brother Junior and Sister Diane with us. Amen. I'm always, I think I've said this before, intrigued how the Lord can lead to a particular text. I was reading a passage from Spurgeon's book, All of Grace. And from that, I got thinking about the ungodly. And Jude speaks quite a bit about the ungodly. Mm-hmm. We'll look at verses 14 and 15 of Jude. It says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Amen. <clears throat> Here, our text begins with Enoch. And this is the Enoch, the seventh from Adam, as he says here, the one who was mentioned in Genesis 5, who walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Same one mentioned in Hebrews 11, where it says that he had this testimony that he pleased God. Mm-hmm. Now, this Enoch is said to have prophesied. Now, we don't have any you know, canonical text by Enoch. We don't have any authoritative books by him, if you will. There is a modern book of Enoch, but that's certainly not divinely preserved and inspired. Right. Amen. You know, I, it does have a verse in it that's nearly identical to this prophecy, so maybe some of the pieces translated over to it, but the Jews most likely passed it down through their oral tradition. But it is possible they had a book or some writings of Enoch around this time. But either which way, the Lord through Jude gives us this prophecy of Enoch. It says, The servant, seventh from Adam, he prophesied of these, saying, These referring back to the ungodly that he's been warning and writing about throughout the book here. He uses Sodom and Gomorrah. He uses those that didn't believe that came out of Egypt. He uses Satan and his disputing as it says about the body of Moses with Michael the archangel. He uses the example of Balaam and Cain and Korah. Of all these ungodly people he's it says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. So you can be sure the Lord is coming again. Amen. Amen. No, I don't know Amen. all the details about it, but he, I know he is coming again. Amen. Matthew 24, verse 44 tells us, For now we think not the Son of Man coming. All right. Same book, Matthew verse, chapter 25, verse 13 tells us, Be ready for us. You know, neither day nor the hour on the Son of Man. Amen. Amen. We cannot set a date on when Christ is coming back. You're right. <coughs> Charles has Russell tried that a couple times and he was wrong. There. Right. I forget. I think the name of Harold Gregory was one. So, someone in the last few years had said, set a date and that came and passed. No, there has been multiple people throughout history that start to say the Lord's coming on this day, but the scripture finally tells us we don't know when he is coming. Amen. But he does say to be ready. Certainly the Lord is coming, that's of a surety, so we ought to be ready. Yeah. And he says he is coming back with ten thousand of the saints. Turn over to Revelation here in just a moment, but this ten thousands of Saints doesn't necessarily mean there's only you know ten thousand or some multitude of ten thousand, so like twenty, thirty thousand. So the Russellites believe there's only 144, at least that was their original belief. Right. I think they've had to modify that since so much time has went on. 
I think now it's only, a, there's 144 that are deleted and then there's some lesser ones. <laughs> but oh, this tens of thousands <coughs> just indicates that it's really an innumerable amount. In fact, we won't turn that over, or excuse me, Hebrews 12, 22, it's translated as an innumerable company. Luke 12, 1, it's translated as an innumerable multitude. So when he's coming back to the saints, it's not going to be just you know, a handful of here in the New Testament. There's going to be multitudes of the saints coming back with them. Right, amen. Let's go over to Revelation for just a moment. Revelation 19. This describes his coming. I'm not going to get into the, the catching away versus the second coming and all of that, but here at the end of the tribulation time period, Revelation 19 verses 11 through 16 describe the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in Amen. righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Amen. That is most certainly the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14 knows, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's the ten thousands of his saints that are coming back with him. Amen. Verse 15 says, And out of his mouth go with a sharp sword, that which that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of all Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of the Lords. And when Christ comes back, he's not coming back to hold hands and sing through by God. Is he? Amen. You know, ironically, that song means. Come on by, dear Lord. <laughs> but no, when Christ comes back, he's coming back in a flaming vengeance, if we will. He's coming back yeah. Yeah. to take vengeance and judgment upon the wicked of this world. And that's really what the whole point of what Jude is saying here, that he is coming back to judge the ungodly. Amen. He's coming back for vengeance upon his people. For all those that have done his people wrong. We'll see that here in just a moment. No, in 2 Timothy verses 4 and 1 says, He shall judge the quick and dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Amen. So both the living and the dead, both the, the small and the great will stand before him. Revelation 20 tells us. Let's turn there for just a moment. I think we're all, I've heard it before, but. Revelation 20 of what we often call the great white throne judgments, or some might refer to the last judgment. Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15 say, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. See, the wicked, they will flee from the presence of God when they stand before him. Right. It's not going to be you stand at the pearly gates and get... See if your name's on the list. Yeah. No, it's either you're accepted in the blood or you'll flee from the, the wicked here. Dude. Verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Amen. And this is one thing that always caught my attention. The world wants so badly to be judged by the works, and right. they, they will be, but they'll, they'll be found lacking. Amen. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And here's the real key, verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. Will be judged by their works and found wanting. Then even to kind of seal the deal, if you will, they'll be their names won't be found in the book of life, and they'll be 
cast the like a fire for all of eternity. All right. That's it. Certainly, we, we ought to be desirous of his coming, but we ought to also, I guess if you will, be sorrowful for those that don't know Christ. So it's not going to be so joyful for them. You're right. Well, Christ is coming to execute judgment. You know, he came to give life the first time, but he's coming to give judgment the second time. So back in our text here, it says, we come with 10,000 of the saints to execute judgment and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds that they have ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. This convince means to convict or to punish. <laughs> if you go come and judge and convict the ungodly, well, their sentence won't just be a, a life sentence, but it will be an eternal sentence. Amen. Let's turn over to Second Thessalonians. Paul kind of echoes the same words of Jude here. Second Thessalonians chapter one. Verses seven through nine. It says, And to you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When Christ comes, he says he's going to come in a, a flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Amen. So he, he's not going to come down and just make the world a happy place with Rainbows and unicorns. That's it. That seems to be the way many people think, or at least want. But that's not what he is coming back for. Certainly, when Satan is banished, when sin is done away with, it will be a place of peace, a place of really great. I don't even know the word to describe it. Great glory and things that we cannot comprehend in our fleshly minds. Amen. Yet before that happens, he has to come and take judgment and vengeance upon the ungodly. On those that, as it says here, know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord? So for all eternity, they will be in the state of destruction. And it says, From the presence of the Lord. So they will not even feel the presence of God there. Right. Amen. I have to think that will be the the worst part of that eternal punishment. Not that the lake of fire will be a pleasant place to be in anyway, but did I feel the presence of the Lord there? I realize we we feel his presence greatly in this place from time to time when he meets with us. Amen. But really his presence is throughout the whole world if it were not it would be wiped out in a second. To imagine a place where there's zero presence of God for all eternity, that's really a, a hard thing to grasp, but there's right, nothing there but eternal torture and eternal destruction, as he calls it here, to be burned for eternity and never consumed. But yet that is what awaits those who obey not the gospel. That's right. The, the ungodly here that you call them. You know, what is this ungodly? It literally means not godly or wicked. The grace of God teaches us to live godly, soberly, righteously in this present world. That's it. But the world and the flesh teaches to live the exact opposite live against God, live against his standards. But are you ungodly? There is still hope. Let's turn over to Romans before we close. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So yes, if you are ungodly, there is still Hope, if you will. Amen. 
For Christ died for those who were ungodly. He didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So the world looks at themselves and sees themselves as good people. As the average person thinks he's doing all right. That he, I bet if you ask most people, they, they think, assuming they believe in some sort of heaven, that they are going to go there. Mm -hmm. But the truth is all are ungodly and in need of Christ, isn't it? If you look back at chapter 4, verse 5, it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. You notice he says he justifieth the ungodly. He doesn't justify the self-righteous. He doesn't justify the holier-than-thou crowd. He justifies those who are ungodly. So all who are saved were ungodly before their conversion. All that have faith in Christ would say they have to have seen themselves as ungodly. If you see yourself as a good person or as righteous or as your good works are going to win your way to heaven, you'll be solely disappointed. Mm -hmm. God justifies those who are the ungodly. Verse 4 says, But him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Amen. If you're working for your salvation, you're working for a debt that you can't pay. Amen. But if, well, what if God has justified you? It's completely of his grace. His faith is counted for righteousness. That's what you stand in need of today if you're ungodly. Amen. To have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not to look to yourselves, not to look to your works, not to look to your, your pastor or the priest or the pope or any of these others. To look to Christ, he's the only one that can save. He's the only one that will justify you, if you will. He's the only one that can turn the ungodly into the godly. But if not, he'll come back taking vengeance on you and come back and judge you according to to those ungodly works. Amen. Let's close with that thought.